Bert? Yes, yep. please. Call to order the Wilsonville City Council work session, March 15th at 5.55 p.m. And I'd like to start by um, asking if anyone has any, if you've had a chance to review the um, work session agenda in order of, or the, um, the consent agenda and order of agenda. As amended. And it looks okay to everyone. Okay. Aye. Any counselor concerns or should we keep going? <laughs> Looks like we're good to go. So um, the first item on our work session is an update on the I-5 pedestrian bridge by Capital Project Engineering Manager Zach Weigel and Senior Planner Kim Reibel. Good evening, Mayor Fitzgerald and members of planning our city council. My name is Zach Weigel, the Capital Projects Engineering Manager. And uh, I'm here before you tonight to give you an update on the I-5 pedestrian bridge project. And uh, members of the design team that are with us tonight are uh, Bob Goodrich with Dow. He is uh, the lead of the project team. And then uh, Alex Stupe and Melissa Erickson with MIG. Um, the last time we were before you, uh, we uh, received direction on the uh, design of the of the bridge and up uh, for the plaza, uh, plaza. and um, we are uh, moving forward with the um, tide arch uh, bridge design and combining the elements of the uh, uh, river oxbow and the drops and ripples plaza design. So the design team since the October meeting have been working hard. We're now at 30% design and ready to to show you what we have, and we hope you're as excited as the staff were when we saw what uh, the design team came up with. So, but that, I'll turn it over to uh, Alex and Melissa. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Zach. Um, I'm Melissa Erickson with MIG. I am going to try and do a fairly quick high level overview just so that everyone can kind of get up to speed on where we are because we want to kind of focus more on discussion just to confirm direction um, and talk about you know where we're heading and how this is going. So with that and without further ado, I will get us going. I'm, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the bridge components specifically along with planning commission comments that we received last week. I'll do the same for the plaza and then we'll plan on opening it up for, for more specific um, discussion and direction. But that's kind of the overview, and I'm going to try and do that in less than 10 minutes. That's the goal. So let's talk about the bridge. Um, as Zach mentioned, uh, we were moving forward with the tight arch option. Um, we like to refer to it as the skipped stone, um, this idea of uh, skipping over the Willamette River and the double arch component, nice, clean, elegant component as far as how it will look as you're on I-5 and addressing that and looking to more specifically look at the pedestrian and bike experience for those people who are actually on the bridge um, as opposed to those who are also seeing it. Based on what we heard from yourselves, Planning Commission, and the public, there were some specific elements of the bridge that were identified as kind of high priority items for customization. Most of those had to do with different levels of lighting components and different elements that could be lit. Looking at some of the um, custom safety fencing that could be included, the colors of the bridge, the overall shapes of components, and some of the bridge lighting. So I'm going to give you some examples of some of the things that we are currently looking at for those options. Lighting is obviously the, the big piece. Um, that is the one that we heard the loudest as far as something that people really wanted to address. And to a certain extent, um, the discussion is about how um, much we want to emphasize that or how much we want to emphasize the structure and or how subtle we want it to be. And so that's a lot of kind of where this on the spectrum, we want to try and get some uh, by additional direction for that. The images on the left-hand side show some options of what kind of recessed lighting could do to help emphasize the actual structure of the bridge. The images on the right-hand side have to do with projected light and what that potentially could do to help kind of highlight the bridge structure and what that might look like. 
other options include looking at LED, which can be kind of more of a, a simple um, defined element, or whether we look at something um, that you often see in different places where you actually have the opportunity to custom color so that could change for different elements or not. There's generally cost considerations, but those are other pieces that we've been looking at. As far as the actual structure, obviously there are safety requirements in general for lighting. There's ODOT standards, all those things we're trying to take a look at. But there is some elements of customization, both on the bridge structure itself, and also then looking at the pedestrian um, and bike experience on the structure um, as people are navigating across. So there are options for us to look at handrail lighting, how that is incorporated and, hand, and or how it is cast onto the ground plane versus overhead, looking at a variety of different um, elements for how that can be articulated that also has some color options that can be considered as well. The bridge structure itself can be colored. Um, and so the options that we've looked at include looking at the Wilsonville logo and pulling off of the blue and the green as options. Um, you know, so that that's something that is read more clearly during the daytime as far as a visual cue. We also looked at options um, including white, a gray, we looked at off-white, though we don't have an image for that. One of the considerations as we look at the color of the actual structure is if the structure itself is colored, it does impact lighting and how strongly or muted the lighting um, options are for projection and or having change in color if that's something that is desirable. Um, the white option gives the greatest range if color is a consideration, um, just as a general caveat. There will be safety fencing along the entire um, bridge structure itself, and there are a range of opportunities there to continue the kind of ripple theme that we've been working with um, based on the direction we've heard from the community. That can be articulated in a variety of different methods and different materials, um, and trying to take a look at how customized that is or not, um, but continuing that kind of delineation to make sure that there's both safety and an aesthetic character within that, and these are some of the options that have been considered. Its actual manifestation as far as how it's structured, the materials, the colors, and or customizations can range quite broadly. And so that's something that we're also considering um, as we're looking at both safety and perception. And we'll forward on the Planning Commission comments, which I think might help illuminate some of the direction we received thus far. The actual bridge railing itself is another piece we're going to be looking at and how that gets um, um, incorporated into the safety fencing and the overall structure, again, trying to make sure that we're looking at, at it both from how the bridge is experienced if you're on I-5, but also paying equal attention to what it is experienced and the visual cues it provides if you are actually on the structure itself. There are two areas where there are retaining walls. So on the west entry, um, along in front of the, the right aid um, uh, distribution center, there's a section where the ramp within the right of way will be on um, a retaining wall section that will be visible as it navigates the change in elevation from street to getting to the height to cross over the I-5 bridge. There are some opportunities there for how that can be um, treated. On the plaza side, there's also a section of retaining wall where, again, we're making that transition between the bridge elevation and to grade, and there's some different options there that we're taking a look at. The plaza side, we'll actually talk a little bit more further, but we'll talk about the west side right now. There are various options. Most of these are looking at form liners, um, pieces that can be kind of repeated and kind of build on a, um, creating a pattern. There's a variety of aspects and customization that can happen on this to help try and take a look at how we want to kind of build in the Wilsonville themes and the overall ripple components. So they work from a variety of components um, from the left side, which are slightly more kind of um, uh, building block scale and or smaller pieces to things that are slightly more customized and maybe at a larger scale for repetition as we move along, along to the images on the right. Again, just a range of options at this point. So from the Planning Commission, the pieces that we heard as far as direction are really trying to focus on the bridge structure itself and having that be kind of like the big move, making sure that we um, look at who is enjoying and who benefits from those elements so that we consider both vehicular and pedestrian um, 
engagement with whatever is provided. There was a preference for the white art bridge, um, arch bridge, pardon me, mainly because of its flexibility for lighting. Um, there was a desire to have lights that could change in color that could be customized and changed throughout the year or by season for events. And the white bridge, because of that, was viewed as um, desirable. Um, the fencing um, that will happen along the bridge, the direction was that it shouldn't be overly ornate, but it should engage users who are actually on the bridge itself. And so trying to balance that out so that is experienced from bikes and ped perspective um, specifically. Path lighting should be fun, should be inviting, um, should focus on the bridge users uh, a little bit more so than it is on the vehiculars. For the walls, again, kind of um, building in and off of the design theming that we have, but paying attention to anti-graffiti um, considerations. And so we'll be working with Public Works as this continues to advance. And then for the walls on the west side, um, and excuse the typo, that's my error, um, but there's an opportunity for there to be some community art component similar to what happens on the Wilsonville Road underpass. Um, and the kind of overarching component for the bridge that we received from Planning Commission was again that the city is only going do this once, let's make it a beauty. Um, and so those are kind of the overarching components. What I'd like to do next is just kind of work us through the plaza and then we can kind of come back and talk about all the pieces and if we have to come back and look at a different image to refresh, we'll do that at that point. So in the light of time, um, as you know, last time we were here, we had two different um, options for the plaza that we were kind of requested to merge. And so we had the, the drops and ripples version of the components that had kind of this play on water ripples and components. And we were asked to combine that with the river oxbow, which had a slightly more passive undulating um, uh, walking and kind of strolling uh, bent to it. And so we merged the two of those. And what we came up with um, is a combination that kind of pulls the key piece from both, both of those aspects. The overall bridge um, comes down and makes a transition. It goes onto the ramp structure and then comes back down to grade as it goes to the gateway plaza. At the eastern end is this gateway plaza. The gray areas are specialty paving to help kind of delineate traffic flow and help identify um, both the site gathering area with seating off to the side, um, but also articulate the um, traffic um, uh, movement through the plaza. There's a series of paths that all kind of undulate in and around the different areas to provide lots of little small pockets off to the side with seating opportunities. The main component that we had heard is that there was a desire for there to be many small scattered seating opportunities as opposed to large gathering areas. And so this is meant to be passive with a variety of places for people to um, have moments and be able to sit by themselves or with a few few folks, but not necessarily a large gathering area. The areas that are kind of toned green-ish have some slight elevation, maybe two or three feet um, max. So there's some variation within the ground plane to provide a little bit of um, verticality to the component. They're all planted. Some of them are lawn. Those are the ones that will be flat. Um, others are planted, but they're meant to imply that they are um, fairly heavily planted um, within the overall components. The areas that you can see that are kind of the orange or the yellow are also planted, but are more at the same ground plane, so they're a little bit more flush to address that. Um, within the other aspects of this, the path kind of works itself underneath the ramp. There's some quieter seating nodes. We also have a path that continues along the north side. Along this face, we are envisioning a green wall um, and a variety of other components, and I'll step through the different areas just to give you an idea of kind of the character um, that each of those areas will have. Um, I will not dwell on very long because it's complicated. Um, this is a complicated plaza um, on purpose, um, but what this plan helps articulate are the trees because the trees don't show up on the other. It's a little bit more diagrammatic. One of the key things we knew that um, was requested was really trying to take a look at rich, diverse plantings that are habitat um, components, um, addressing birds, bees, et cetera, also climate appropriate, but bringing in trees specifically was something that was really addressed. And so you can kind of see the number of trees that we're bringing in um, to help address that component. And then I'm just gonna briefly go over kind of some of the different aspects within the plaza before we'll kind of end this. These are 
of the key pieces we heard from the public and from yourselves as far as the key driving elements, making sure that this is artful, that we're looking at sustainable components, really bringing in a diversity of plantings, having some mix of more formal with tree allays and shade, but also kind of bringing in as much planting as possible, making sure we look at shade and rain so that there's um, areas to be enjoyed no matter the weather, and then again, providing multiple smaller spaces for people to engage. So in the top on these slides, you'll see a very small key map and then a hot pink shape so you kind of know roughly where these things are located. Within the Cascade Plaza, which is the largest but not a large um, gathering area, the thought is that that wall as the ramp is coming down is going to be a rock wall building off of some of the Morassi Plaza that you have and the stonework in the adjacent parks within um, Town Center and building off of that to kind of articulate the edge and create a rich texture um, and also to try and help buffer some of the sound within the area. All of the hot pink areas are areas we're looking for specialty pavers. Um, we're looking right now at a range of um, hexagonal shaped pavers so that we can look at creating a slightly more pixelated ripple um, effect in, in the ground plane. Um, we know that there's some concerns with maintenance, so we're kind of exploring that option a little bit further, but trying to pull something that kind of helps, again, bring in that, that drops and ripples flow throughout the process. And these are images of what it might look like as we advance. Along the north side of the ramp as it makes its um, navigation between street level and to the overhead bridge structure and underneath that component, we're looking at a green wall. Um, one, both to activate the north side and have it be a space that people want to come and see, but also to take advantage of the water that will be coming off the structure and using it as another way to kind of help um, absorb sound and provide stormwater components as well as just a, a, a visually rich area um, in an area that otherwise it kind of turns its back to the plaza. Seating, um, as we said, lots of small scattered seating kind of scattered throughout the area, but we're looking at some untraditional opportunities, playing off of the drops and ripples and skip stones and playing around with some different components of what those things might be, um, including some things that look a little bit more like stones. But we've included some areas where we're kind of working into the, the elevation and the slight mounds that we're providing so those can be cut in. Um, our thinking, though we aren't showing it yet, is that some of these would actually have a shade structure attached to it, and that would be help kind of emphasize the drops and ripples as well as provide some opportunities to address in all weather. The planted areas and mounds, um, the thought is, are these are trying to kind of bring in a little bit of kind of more passive green space that could provide a little bit of um, opportunity for folks to kind of move around and address those different areas. Um, the ones that would be mowed would be very gentle. Most of the others would be planted, but the idea of trying to bring in some elevation change within the ground plane because it is relatively flat and provide a little bit more visual interest. The, drip, uh, the ripples obviously are kind of a key piece, and so in some cases we're looking at emphasizing that through planting patterns and using that to kind of emphasize these these rings of components. In some cases it's in the paving itself. In other cases we're looking at flesh mow bands to help kind of further accentuate where, how that is continuing throughout the, the entire plaza. The rain garden, um, which is a small little piece um, kind of within this that we've been, been looking at, um, slightly changed from what we had thought originally as we started looking at the existing infrastructure and kind of where water was traveling on site and where we could capture it. But there is a piece where we will have a slight boardwalk so the stormwater garden can go underneath that all feeds into the overall planting within the area and continues to kind of um, allow this to be a place that has interest um, no matter the weather um, or whether it's raining or not. The Planning Commission, um, we had heard that in general they were very excited um, about the options and they really felt like this was a, a good capturing of what we had kind of heard um, and this is true for the bridge too as far as um, a good forwarding of the process based on the comments we've heard today. It, specifically, they really like the green wall, they like the rock seating, um, and they like that the seating is varied um, and scattered throughout. There was concern about the noise from I-5, which we share, um, and trying to think about whether a water feature or some other component could help try and help address some of those concerns, particularly on the west side of the plaza. And then the desire to make sure that we add covered seating um, at some of these places so that there would be opportunities both for uh, protection from sun, but also from rain and the other elements. So I realized that was a very um, 
fast <laughs> overview, but in the light of time, what I was hoping that we could do, and I'll pass this to Zach um, to address back, is one, just trying to get feedback from you all as far as if there are additional feedback as we look towards um, working on the 60% drawing, could there are specific elements that um, you want to see us further refine or have comments on so that we can make sure that we're continuing to advance as we get into details um, and keep moving this forward. And with that, I will pass this back to Zach. Thank you, Melissa. Um, yeah, I think on the, uh, I believe on the next slide we had some questions. Yeah. So um, we shared the feedback that we received from Planning Commission and um, I think we're, we're, the design team's interested to see if there's any additional uh, comments. Uh, if you agree with Planning Commission, any additional feedback you want to provide. Um, and then as, you know, as we work through the design, and we start refining costs. Are there any elements that you feel that um, are not as important or could be reduced in quality or, or scope um, as we move forward? And then is there any um, additional public feedback that would be helpful um, as we move forward uh, in the design? Thank you. Any comments, council? Um, I guess I would add that I, in the lighting back at the beginning when we talked about lighting and the color of the bridge, I was thinking um, that I like the blue green, but I think there's a good point about white because it would stand the test of time and you could certainly add color with lighting. I saw the planning commission like that. And I also, um, you know, appreciated the, the comments, I think, from the Planning Commission and others earlier about making sure that the materials used on the paver service surfaces are, you know, they're not going to require excessive maintenance and replacement. And so there must be a way to figure that out. I think that's important. Those are some things. And then as far as the seating is concerned, um, I guess my last thought there is I also thought the, the attention to mitigating sound is, seems to be important to get people to want to sit there. And I don't know how much can be done about that. But the water, the plantings, and the reusing the purpose of stormwater all seem like good ideas. Anyone else? I think you're muted, Councilor Linville. I was waiting to be recognized. My hand is up. It's not showing. I'm sorry that I mean, need to get that feature turned on because it's not it's not happening right now. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, I uh, I agree that the that the white allows us the most flexibility. Um, one of the um, things that I um, I mean I I. I kind of liked um, I like the idea of pulling the what we currently have on the off ramp on the northbound off ramp of the concrete trees. And given that we're Tree City USA, um, I like that idea of carrying that theme somehow into those walls. Um, I, I really do like that among all of the other options. I'm not terribly excited about the, the blocks. Um, and um, one of the concerns that I had about the lighting was uh, night safety and having enough lighting at night on the walk, on the path itself and on the bridge that people felt safe enough to be able to walk and not be afraid that um, maybe somebody was waiting up ahead that they couldn't see or couldn't see them. And then the last comment that I had, I mean, I loved all, a lot of the other design features, um, uh, and but I noticed in all of the seating areas, there's no tables. Um, and I think if someone's going to come and sit and have their lunch or sit with a child and, and um, have them color or uh, look at books. Um, 
uh, or work on their laptop uh, during the lunchtime, uh, they need to have a hard surface to be able to put um, you know, those items on and to just have wall seating that is contiguous, you know, it's just kind of, you have to sit side by side. It, it isn't conducive to people congregating and visiting. Um, so I had a little bit of concern about, uh, uh, about that as a design feature, but, and it seemed to be that wall, that, um, bench wall was kind of the model of, um, uh, around the area. So those are really my comments. Councilor Offerly. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. I'm really excited about um, this project and what you've shared. I think that the Planning Commission's comments are excellent and um, I think that they really echo some of the thoughts that I have. Um, I would add a couple points. Um, one of them is lighting. I agree, as others have expressed, that lighting is important for, you know, feeling of safety and just, you know, visibility, you don't trip, all sorts of things. Um, I wonder, how, I, I mean, I understand that lighting can be done in many different ways and the angles of the light and things can still be very well lit and still be dark sky compliant. Um, and so I wanted to bring that up as, as something, you know, that I hope is on the, on the horizon and, and, and mindset for, for everyone. Um, you know, I think we chose this design of the bridge because it's very strong design, classic. And so I hope that our lighting would be congruent with that. Um, and the screening as, as well, I think you brought up you know, the, the different screening examples, something that isn't um, unnecessarily fussy because I don't necessarily think that's congruent with this, this design that we've um, landed on. Um, for the form liner, it did occur to me, I agree with Councilor Lee, um, Linville's comments on, on kind of her, her take on some of the possibilities that um, are very pleasing there. It did occur to me our wayfinding plan has some materials that we use that were kind of um, like stone bases for some of the signs. And I wondered, like one of the, the small pictures actually kind of echoed something that I thought I remembered from the wayfinding plan. And so I thought, oh, is this an opportunity to kind of um, thread those elements together? I don't know. I love the green wall, the fern wall. I think that's a really exciting element. Um, for the seating, I did want to bring up one point and um, agree with Councillor Linville's suggestion of having places where you know small groups could get together. Um, I hope. I, I like the large stones, you know, some of these different creative seating ideas. I hope that we will also have seating where um, ADA. Um, you know, perspective is brought into play and a wheelchair or a stroller um, could join a seating group and not just be adjacent to a seating group. Um, but th that would be something that would be welcomed in this space because I think we certainly want to do that as a city. So thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, I think in the interest of hearing more, should we keep moving on? Are you, are you uh, did you get the direction you needed staff, consultants? Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we will move move forward with 60% uh, design. Thank you. All right, and Mayor, I'm gonna recommend you, if with your permission here um, and your discretion, if you could move legislative redistricting to be the next item. I think uh, the building fire code issues are things that we have no control over. It's just gonna be a brief update on what those changes are. And then the electric bus purchase is a, is a grant funded. And I don't think Dwight's gonna need a lot of time on that one either, but I'm a little concerned that we won't get to the legislative redistricting. So could you do that one next? I certainly will. So our next item is an update on, as you've heard, the legislative redistricting by government, government and public affairs director, Mark Ottenat. Thank you. And I just texted Mr. Ottenau to let him know that he needed to uh, cut off his dinner so he could 
zoom in here. <laughs> Is he okay? Did we find him? Uh, Mr. Leo's here, so he can get going. Okay, thank you, Mr. Leo. Thank you. Um, uh, Mayor and members of the Wilsonville City Council, for the record, my name is Greg Leo, and I'm with the Leo Company, your government affairs consultant. Uh, tonight, you have before you information about the 2021 redistricting plan. Uh, the legislature is going through a process it does every 10 years to redraw congressional and uh, House and Senate redistricting lines. So in the material that you have before you tonight in the packet, you can see that there's a set of criteria for determining uh, where the districts should be, where the uh, House of Representatives and Senate districts for the state of Oregon House and Senate and the congressional district uh, lines, the criteria that should be used to redrawing these lines. Our uh, idea here is that this is a good opportunity for the city to review this from the standpoint of what are the communities of interest that we have the most in common with and that we provide guidance to the legislature as they go about the redistricting process. It is uh, somewhat complicated, but I will just say, by the time the uh, process is over, there will be uh, districts that will be drawn to within one or two people for congressional districts, and plus or minus maybe 2% of population for state, house, and senate districts. So it's a question of adding or subtracting people to get to the right number, to make sure that the natural and political boundaries are followed and that you keep uh, consistent you know with the communities of interest that the different cities have it is my great pleasure now to introduce my associate Mark Ottenhead. Mark did you want to add a few points to that uh, well thank you uh, mayor and city council um, got admitted here into the to the to meeting thank you um, basically really the, the, the core question at hand for the council is um, would the council like to request that uh, in looking at redistricting, redistricting that the committee uh, consider an option to include all of Wilsonville, uh, including the Charbonneau District and future urban areas of Wilsonville all together in uh, one district? Uh, previously, 10 years ago, the city council uh, made this same request actually during the redistricting process but unfortunately, that was not the option that was chosen at the time. And Charbonneau was segmented away into a different district from uh, the rest of the Wilsonville uh, using the Willamette River as a boundary. Um, so we have an opportunity to request that the city is again all in one uh, legislative district, Is that if that is your preference. And the secondary question that I don't know if we can really answer is, do we have a preference with where else we would be represented. That is, um, House District 26 has been with Sherwood for over 30 years. Uh, Sherwood is our um, high school, uh, our primary uh, uh, opponent in the high school Civil War games. Uh, but um, we do share Westland, the Westland Wilsonville School District. Um, we share other interests with Twaladen. Uh However, it's unlikely that legislators who currently serve would be anxious to have a new constituency to which they would have to run and be elected. Uh, therefore, we may or may not wish to comment on with whom we will be a partner, assuming that all of Wilson does not fit in one legislative district, uh, House district, and therefore um, those are kind of our options at this point, is mainly asking to be in one district, and then if you had any thoughts on being uh, with another city as our co-district city. Thank you. Happy to entertain questions. Uh, Councilor Linville. I, I just have a question about, I think I read in the material and I can't find it right at the tip of my fingers right now, mm -hmm. that um, at one point, Charbonneau was included in all of, with all of Wilsonville. Is that, that not is correct? True. No, it is. It's in the packet, and it is true. And we were all in House District 26, and then in 2011, Charbonneau went to House District 39. So, and that was drawn because of the Canby uh, school district line. Mark, did you want to add something there? No, that's correct. Yeah. 
Um, so in what, a way, we're, we're just what reunifying if, here. <laughs> what, if any, um, implications does that have for um, the Canby School District? In this case, it doesn't have to do with the collection of any revenues for the school district or any district boundaries. It was just a political boundary that was handy uh, in order to make the correct size district. So, uh, you know, they'll follow political jurisdictions, natural boundaries, uh, in some cases, uh, roads. In my case, personally, my house is in uh, one house district and my mailbox is in another district because the line runs right along the front of my house. And that means I have two different senators. Now, from representing you in Salem, there you know, are advantages and disadvantages. Having uh, the whole city in one district really helps us uh, work with that one member. To having several districts, I probably get less time and attention for the fragments of our city that are in other uh, House and Senate districts. So by consolidating the city, I think we might get more uh, more time and attention from the one member that represents the district rather than right now where you have two senators and two House members. Well, um, it, you brought up you, you brought up two questions really, and and I, I think the idea is that we should offer our pref I mean our preference, right? And it seems yes. to me that personally, we would have um, we would our citizens of Wilsonville. It seems logically they would be best served to have be in this have the whole city in the same legislative district if we can do that. That is our assessment, and that was the assessment of the city council in 2011 also. And pairing with a second city when you're co-terminus with two districts, it, having them both in metro would be helpful. For example, we're essentially paired can be now because Charbonneau being in uh, House District 38. So, you know, the idea that uh, one city is in metro and one city isn't in metro. I think sometimes that pre that leads to some, uh, uh, you know, discongruity in terms of policy. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, I think I. Yeah. Any more? Any other comments about the city's or input, Councillor Ackerbell? Well, I had a quick question. Um, <clears throat> I read in the packet and understand 2011. Um, you know, when this last occurred, that the, the city did ask to be considered in, you know, in the same group, in one group, um, but that didn't happen. And so, did we get feedback on why that decision, or it, was that ever shared? <laughs> in the Agraval, we were told it was a matter of making right-sized districts and that, you know, that the school district boundary was the convenient political jurisdiction line. So it was purely um, to get the appropriate size numbers instead of um, this serves you well in, you know, this one reason or angle or another. No. I, I will say that's what we were told. Okay. That's what we were told. <laughs> Councillor Leham. Uh, yes, uh, the, the big change happened in uh, 20 years ago in 01, and we objected then. But uh, um, this, is, this was a pure case of gerrymandering. And we were gerrymandered into by the Democrats into a Republican district, so that they could keep the best parts of, which is to say, Democrat uh, segments of West Lynn and Lake Oswego in with Portland, or the south end of Portland. And they threw Wilsonville to the wolves and stuck us with Kaiser and Gaston two places which we have no community of interest. I would say probably half the people in Wilsonville have never been to Gaston or wouldn't know how to get there. Um, and don't spend any time in Kaiser either. Uh, but 
but it was uh, it was gerrymandered we by uh, in this case by the Democrats for to their advantage, um, but it just didn't happen to be to Wilsonville's advantage, and we were we ended up being split into these other communities that we had no particular interest with. Now, if we were looking at purely communities of interest, we have two communities that we have a strong interest with. One is West Lynn because of the West Lynn Wilsonville School District, and the other is Tualatin because of our joint uh, industrial complexes that bleed into each other. Um, uh, and all of those are communities of Metro and, and share a lot of the Southwest suburbs issues. Um, um, our next communities of interest would be Canby, Aurora, and Newburgh. We have a number of political issues that come up with those places, but you know, they're not none of them part of Metro, so that's uh, they're they're sort of the next realm outside of us. Um, Gaston and Kaiser. You just can't even figure a, a way to to. Uh, you can't find a rationale for Gaston and Kaiser. You could you could maybe come up with something for Camby, Aurora, and Newburgh, but um, uh, so anyway, I think we are well within. I, I don't know that it will do any more good this time around than it has the last two times around, but. Um, because, you know, and I, I say this as a loyal Democrat, uh, the Democrats are uh, in control. And, uh, and this is what happens with districting, redistricting. It's a gerrymandering thing, and the party in control is trying to figure out how to put together districts that will give them the most statewide power, and that's what's happened, and we are, we are collateral damage. So I think we should make the case like we've made it twice before. I don't hold great hopes that we will prevail. Uh, Mr. Leo, anything you you would uh, object to on what I have just said? Oh, no, I, I, I certainly wouldn't do that, no. But I do think as we have a point of view and this council makes a policy decision, the earlier we communicate that and the, the more we repeat it in various hearings and in various conversations with members of the House and Senate Redistricting Committee, the more likely we will be to get an outcome that we like and that we will have to live with for 10 years. So make a clear, clean decision and give us direction and we'll go forth and do our best to make it happen. Well, I, my first choice would be, uh, of course, to be, to be a, a community of interest with West Lynn because we are both Clackamas County, we are the same school district and we, uh, we are both in Metro. Um, Tualatin would be a, a second one, be, a second choice because it's in a different county and we share less with them. But um, but anyway, that that would be. And we we testified to this at um, back in '01, and and um, I submitted testimony I will never forget because it was on 9/11, and um, mm. and I. I picked up the papers to sign that had to be back to the Secretary of State's office. And by the time I got back with the papers, they said no planes were flying and we couldn't get it in. Um, now the Secretary of State did allow us, uh, uh, allow us extra, an extra week or something. Uh, they gave us a time, but it didn't do any, any good because uh, uh, they're, they're they were going to do what they were going to do, but but we we did get caught up in 9/11 trying to get our objection in. Now we should have that paperwork somewhere. It was a pretty hefty piece of stuff we filed um, with the Secretary of State's office objecting in 01 um, to that redistricting at that time. Um, so anyway, now I, I, I would be interested in taking a look at that, whatever we filed that was caught up in the flight paths. Well, 
Thank you. I, I too would like to see that. And I'm just going to just review in the packet what the legislation says, the five points that are supposed to be our guideline or the or, or state's guideline in these things is these um, areas should be contiguous of equal population, utilize existing geography or political boundaries, which we talked about, not divide communities of common interest. And then the last one is be connected by transportation links. Well, um, so that helps guide us too on the fact that it certainly would be logical to have Charbonneau connected because of the transportation links and all these other things. We have our smart transportation that serves Charbonneau, and then smart transportation also helps link us to some other areas. The point out of these points that I, I don't know if we have it right here is, is the um, population consideration for West Lynn or Tualatin, and how would that, are they equal? Would, would they have to be split? Or do you know how those would work population-wise all these years later? Uh, Mayor, I believe that in either case, that additional territory would have to be brought in. Uh, each of our communities is roughly around 25, 26,000, uh, give or take a bit. So. Uh, given that the target will probably be over uh, 60,000, I believe, uh, for the population, then there's a, a likelihood they'll take in just extra territory, no matter what other cities we get lumped with. Yeah, and, okay. and if I might add, on transportation uh, links, I-5 is the obvious big one, and I-5 is a topic of much discussion right now in Salem. You know, not only our Boone Bridge, but also the whole congestion plan for the entire region. So I would also suggest we think about the linkages to I-5, Charbonneau being one of the important, but also other communities that are served by I-5. Uh, Council Linville. I, I just wonder if there are any other cities in the state of Oregon that are split between two districts like ours. Yes, there are. There are. I would say there are many. You know, and uh, especially larger cities, uh, Portland, Eugene, uh, Salem. Mm -hmm. uh, the more population you have, the more likely you are to be split. And uh, the question is, do they stay uh, as a community of interest urban or do they act like the spokes of a wheel and have one side in urban and reach out into rural? So uh, we see cases in Portland, for example, where there are a mixture of different jurisdictions that are in one district. So I would say it's relatively common that cities are split uh, in the uh, redistricting process. Well, just as a follow-up to that, I guess, I'm wondering, uh, when I said cities like ours, I'm wondering city size by uh, like about 25,000, if there are any of those. Um, and ben how is a great how example. How does that happen? It is uh, it, where they make a good point about keeping uh, you know, cities in one district they can do extraordinary things. If you look at the redistricting map for Bend, you can see the, the, you know, the city of Bend is around circle, completely surrounded by another district. So uh, in that case, Bend was able to successfully uh, make the case that they needed to stay as one uh, legislative district. So I, th I think it all matters on um, what your needs are, what kind of district you want, and how well you advocate for your needs. Yeah, yeah it, it's, uh, I mean, the, the maps you should look at are uh, Senate District 13, uh, either one, but especially the 01 to 11, um, mm -hmm. I always referred to it as a boomerang district that was, um, went over and picked up Wilsonville because we, and also picked up Charbonneau because we had a high percentage of Republican registered voters. But you'll notice how it completely misses I-5 and the Democratic 
districts of Woodburn. It, um, it, you know, it, it goes out of its way to avoid those, to avoid West Lynn, to Wallaton, where you would find more Democrats, and slips on out to South Hillsboro. I mean, it, it is uh, it is as gerrymandered a, a district as you could find, I think, in the whole state of Oregon. Um, now they they changed it a little bit in the 11 version, uh, but almost made it worse for Wilsonville because they cut Charbonneau off, um, and still went out of their way to avoid Woodburn and go down and grab Kaiser, a very Republican place. So, you know, it's just fishy. The whole thing is it's not even fishy. It's just obvious. Yeah. Thank you. I think Councillor Linville, you have your hand up, or is that an artifact? Okay. So, um, Mr. Altnad, we've we've heard a number of comments and thoughts and theories and concepts. Where do we go from here? How much more information do we need, or, or can we? You know, do we have enough for today? Well, um, uh, thank you, Mayor. It, it, it sounds like there's a, probably a, a unanimous uh, agreement to have Wilsonville all be in one district. Um, uh, Councilor Lehan probably gave the uh, clearest explanation of why perhaps West Lynn uh, would be a more appropriate city to be paired with than, say, um, uh, Sherwood, and, as well as potentially Tualatin. And we note this in the staff report, but the staff did not provide a recommendation on this particular issue. But we're happy to do as the council sees. As I, uh, so if you would like for us to indicate a preference for a city for Wilsonville to be paired with, we're happy to do so. Um, otherwise, we can just ask for Wilsonville to be all in one district. We're happy to do as you wish. Um, I heard consensus on being all in one district. I personally also like the idea of pairing with West Lynn because of the school, I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyone else to add to that? Well, well, the, the thing to look at is who is West Lynn paired with? Uh, mm -hmm. Are they paired uh, with Lake Oswego? Uh, Lake Oswego? Then, mm -hmm. uh, yes. you know, there's a, uh, a domino effect of if you're if you're gonna switch cities, obviously Lake Oswego is probably not, well, I don't know, I'll take that back, not obviously. Maybe Lake Oswego should be, is more logically paired with Tualatin, for instance, because they share the freeway in a different way, uh, side to side. Um, but, uh, but anyway, uh, you, you have to look at if you're, you can't just pick a, a city out of the air and say, I like this one, I want to be paired with this one, and not take a look at what does that mean downstream? Where, where does it leave like us? I mean, where, do, where does it leave West Lynn? Um, because obviously, if West Lynn doesn't think it's a good idea, it's probably going nowhere. And I think yeah, the I 5 consideration is a really big one. Yeah, yeah. But who doesn't yeah, this, have a uh, Marcus Prada. Um, I don't. House District 37 isn't paired with Lake Oswego. It's paired yeah. with uh, Tualatin. And you can see that they've really kept well to the transportation linkage with, you know, uh, with the highway, uh, the 205 there. So. Yeah. Well, so that I mean, is, I, that's, that's why uh, not looking at anybody else's districts and how they are paired up. That's hard to say. I think we could, as a council, clearly state that we would prefer to have our whole city in one House district and one Senate district, that we feel strongly about that. Um, uh, if we are paired with a Senate district, um, I, I, I would that would take a little bit more um, looking into it. Just from our perspective, mm -hmm. from Wilsonville's perspective, I would say, West Lynn would be my top choice, Tualatin would be number two. But um, Sherwood is not bad, but as far as a Senate district, Kaiser is not good. We, we can't be going all the way down to Kaiser and pulling them in, missing Woodburn, and uh, I mean, that's just craziness. Uh, Mayor, so that uh, it, indeed, uh, 
this is one of those issues where you, you pull on one side or you push the envelope of the balloon on one side and it bulges on the other. Yeah, right. right. You know, there's so many. That's why us staff were hesitant on making a recommendation on the second part of the topic as to who we would pair with. Whereas it's easy to say, well, we all want to be together, um, and and so that seems to be the consensus. But we do see hearing a desire that if we were, if we had any choice, it appears that West Lynn first and Tallinn and second would be more of a community of interest than maybe otherwise. Yeah. And, and I think you can also then say, and Sherwood number three, and um, you know, and then go on down the list. But but so that so that um, we're, we don't appear to be um, intransient uh, uh, in our opinion, and say you, you have to. We absolutely want this one. Whatever works best, because we know there's all the all the boundaries move. Um, but. But just to make a strong case that these three cities or four cities, whatever they are, make a lot more sense for us to be paired with than those four cities, you know, uh, Kaiser, Gaston, Hillsboro, whatever. I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, also, I've heard every, we've had a lot of comments about the importance of I-5 and transportation corridors, too. So is that enough for today? Yes, I think we can move forward and uh, draft testimony uh, for your review. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Thank you. City Manager Cosgrove, would you like us to move to the um, building codes report? Yeah, I'll just ask Dan to double up because they're both uh, changes from the state. So just high level. You got it. It's not like we have a lot of it, options sir. and whether or not we're going to adopt them. We, we kind of have to, but yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, could I ask that you also bring in Steve Forrester? We're going to double up on this and get this done in, in uh, half the time. So, hello, Mayor Fitzgerald and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Dan Carlson, and I have the pleasure of serving as the city's building official. I'm here tonight to seek your approval to adopt two resolutions. Uh, resolution 2883 and 2884, uh, the staff report in your packet starts on page 125. Uh, resolution 2883 is really intended to adopt the new Oregon Plumbing Specialty Code and the Oregon Electrical Specialty Code. Uh, 2884 is intended to acknowledge and approve Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue Ordinance 2020-01 for effective administration of the fire code within the city of Wilsonville. Steve Forrester, Fire Marshal for Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue, is with us tonight to provide a report covering the background for the resolution. Well, again, we'll keep this super short. Uh, with regard to the adoption of the statewide plumbing and electrical codes, the state adopts technical provisions based on the national model code. The state amends the code through their own technical committees and advisory boards and their public hearing process. Once the public process is complete, it then becomes the Oregon Specialty Code. And the state establishes an effective date. In this case, the effective date is April 1st of 2021. Locally, each jurisdiction adopts the state specialty codes and administers them through the local building departments. Uh, there are a lot of code changes coming our way through the plumbing and electrical code. I was going to highlight some of those for you, but in the interest of time, I will not do that. Um, just know that all of those changes are, are in a matrix on the State Building Codes Division's website. Uh, it's very easy to find for anybody in the public who may be interested in watching. Uh, there is a third code that's being adopted, and that is the Oregon Residential Specialty Code. However, this code isn't available yet in print, and the state has a provided a six-month grace period uh, which to implement this code. So when it is available and staff can analyze it, we'll move forward with adoption of the residential code in the near future. Uh, lastly, within the, with the resolution of 2883 being in your packet, it also includes two exhibits that show the adoption of the plumbing and electrical codes. Um, and so now I would guess I would turn it over to Steve. And Steve, if you have any, any background you'd like to share. Yeah, uh, th thanks, Dan. Uh, it's an honor to be here tonight. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time. Um, 
The, uh, the, the fire code resolution uh, is really pretty straightforward. Um, it's a routine uh, adoption. State law requires when, um, when a fire district adopts a new fire code ordinance, state law actually requires that a city approve uh, by resolution um, that ordinance if they want that ordinance to apply within city limits. So we typically come before uh, the city. Um, uh, in this case, we actually skip the code cycle, so we haven't been before you since 2014. Um, but that, uh, that really is it. The resolution simply approves of the ordinance. It doesn't change any responsibilities or authorities. Uh, relationship between the city and TVFNR has no financial impact on, TV, uh, on the city uh, and doesn't uh, impose any sort of legal obligations or requirements or enforcement uh, uh, requirements on the city. Um, the ordinance automatically updates any uh, the latest changes that the state makes. So as the state makes regular amendments, changes, um, they've adopted emergency provisions, that sort of thing that's automatically adopted. So I think that's really it on our end and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any Thank questions? You, Thank you. Um, I don't, Councillor Linville, please. Um, I noticed in exhibit three that um, the word, it, it is said it's for TVFNR to maintain and it's in quote, exempt fire district status. Can you, can you help me figure out what that means? Yeah, absolutely. So exempt stat So basically, the way that the fire codes in, in enforcement and authority over fire codes work in the state of Oregon that is that all authority is granted to the state fire marshal's office, um, and they can delegate authority to local fire districts, um, whether that's fire districts, city fire departments, etc. Um, but the departments are allowed to apply for exempt status. Uh, and then they become basically partially exempt, meaning the authority and the enforcement um, goes directly to that fire district without having to go through Salem and the state fire marshals first. It allows us to have much more uh, sort of local control, provide better customer service, allows us to maintain our own appeals board, that sort of thing. And so that's, what, that's one of the reasons we have to um, uh, get these, these ordinances approved by the cities and counties we serve is because we do have that exempt status. Uh, with the state. Thank you. I am not seeing any more hands raised. Does that sound correct? All right, thank you very much for this report. And now we will move to the report from the Transit Department with Wright Brashear and his team. All right, good evening, uh, City Council Mayor. Dwight Brashear, I'm the Transit Director for SMART, and we are interested in buying our third electric bus. And joining me this evening to talk a little bit more about that is Scott Simonton, our Fleet Manager. Uh, Scott. There he is. All right, good evening, Scott Simonton, City's Fleet Manager. Um, the item I have tonight is just a um, seeking council approval to award a contract to Proterra for the third electric bus. Um, this bus will be identical to the two that we've had in service since 2019. Uh, total cost of the contract is uh, $842,838, 80% 80 of that covered by a federal grant with uh, the remaining 20% local match of 168,000 coming from statewide transportation improvement funding money that SMART already has. Um, we've only got a minute or two, so if, if there are any questions uh, regarding the contract, I'm here to answer. Council Linville. I just want to thank you very much for us not to have to understand all of the specifications of the bus. <laughs> That, that was that was a lot of detail, and uh, as long as you understand it, Scott, that's just great with me. Thank you. Yes, there's a lot to it. I would add that. Oh, Councilor Council President Ockerbell, please. 
Oh, sure. I, I just wanted to say, I noticed also in, in the packet information about this, um, that it says that the addition of this vehicle will complete the electrification of the entire Route 4 within Wilsonville. And I wanted to highlight that and say congratulations. Um, because I think that's a, a goal that the um, SMART has had, you know, in moving in that direction, and um, that's an exciting thing. Is anybody else in Oregon? No, we would be the first in the state of Oregon to have one of its routes completely electrified. I didn't want to lose the opportunity for to hear Dwight say that again. Yeah. <laughs> We're excited about well, that. Well, I had, that's wonderful. I had the opportunity to uh, visit with Dwight Brashears and Scott Simonson and a number of, of their team today and toured the facility. And in fact, they were putting some um, labels, you know, wrapping the bus, some new buses. We had our local, um, one of our local businesses um, who was working on that as a vendor also. And it was just really great to see how comprehensive our transit um, service in Wilsonville is, and again, linking with these other communities, it just comes up all the time. And um, we should be pretty proud of the fact that we continue to be worthy of these kinds of grants. And I want to thank our staff for this. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. You did it. Congratulations. I didn't think we'd make it, but we did. Okay, so um, this will conclude um, our work session. I'll adjourn the work session, and we will see you in seven minutes at the city council meeting. Yeah, so you can just uh, mute your mics and uh, let your cameras go blank, and we'll see you in seven.